10, it's just a cold sore. The Victorian era is cool. The art, the fashion, and technology of the time, I think, are always fun to take a look at, especially since steampunk has its roots in the Victorian era, and who doesn't like steampunk? Come on, there's just a lot of cool steampunk stuff. And honestly, we haven't seen a lot of that in a long time. We need, we need more, we need more. Something not so cool from that era, however, was what you could catch from another person should you decide to take up a bed with another person. Syphilis, yep, one heck of a disease. Funny enough, it was so common that it was making intimacy itself an unusual practice. People were scared, and honestly, maybe rightfully so. There's no cure, and if it progresses to its later stages back then, well, you'd go crazy. And then you'd end up being that guy that's always screaming in the streets. Every city has one. You know what I'm talking about. Number nine, the French letter. The issues of intimacy and its repercussions were becoming quite clear in the Victorian era. Something had to be done, as spending any amount of time in the brothels could have you shucking barnacles off your lower deck in the morning, if you know what I mean. Introducing the revolutionary new invention, prophylactics. For those that are college age, you might find it disturbing that these party favors weren't made of rubber or disposable. Yeah, hear me out. They were made of sheep's guts and they had to be soaked first so they would become flexible. Because when you put these bad boys on, they had to be fastened on. It's not very good, not very attractive. Once the deed had been signed off on, the device was then washed and then hung up to dry like your dirty laundry. Once it was dry, it was placed in a small box for the next time. Because seeing your wife's ankles might make you feel a certain kind of way and now you just have it ready to go. And Number eight, the products of our sins. Having fun when the lights can be turned off is great. Who doesn't enjoy a little toe curling, yeah? Except sometimes there's this crazy thing that can happen where after nine months, another human spawns in. Insane, right? I know. Well, back in the Victorian era, this phenomenon was happening, but only for married couples. As you have to be married, of course, or else a child would be born out of wedlock, which to people at the time was just the worst. Oh, I never. These stigmas were not favorable for women, as some preferred to avoid that kind of press by abandoning or straight up just unaliving their children. Horrible, just, just horrible times. Just another one of those good old wholesome times in history where we were treating women with the utmost respect and decency. Very nice. We were actually not very nice. Number seven, diet. Bedroom misconduct was becoming a huge issue. Refer to number nine and 10. While women did get most of the blame because, well, you know, history, men did get some of the blame. The issue of intimacy for men could be described as barbaric primal sense. So how do we curb this? How do we stop men from acting on these caveman urges, ooga booga? Well, simple really. Men just have to stop eating certain foods, as it was thought at the time that food had a link to the misconduct, or rather, the overabundance of bedroom related issues, including mustard, pepper, rich gravy, beer, wine, cider, and tobacco. And if you weren't paying attention, that's basically the diet of every man in Victorian times. Not sure how a jar of finely prepped mustard would get you flustered, but okay, sure. The beer makes sense though, you know, have a few beers, and even the mop leaning over in the corner looks pretty lonely and Boy, that mop has lovely hair. Number six, job market. Ladies of the evening, women of the night. Women who make beds go bump in the night. They were everywhere in Victorian London, a lot. It's partially related to some of the points I previously mentioned. Now, I'm not here to say it's necessarily a bad thing. Personally, I don't think it is. As they say, it's the oldest profession in the book, with an estimated 80,000 women working in the night by the late 1890s. You'd have to be crazy to miss that. I mean, they, they were literally everywhere. With numbers like that, there's something for everyone and in varying price ranges, as they can be found in brothels or townhomes set up by the wealthy men for their mistresses, pretty much anywhere trouble likes to spawn. Even some artists took advantage of this by living with the gorgeous girls of the evening, as going behind closed doors with one was debatable, but becoming friends? Now that's a social transgression. That, oh, becoming friend. Oh, how dare you befriend the people of the night? Number five, Jolly Lad. When people think about certain magazines that depict lewd imagery, you probably only think of Playboy. The bunny imagery was good marketing, honestly, just, just smart. But what if I told you the Hefmeister wasn't the first to publish such a magazine or imagery? Back in the Victorian era, there was some saucy imagery being produced. The government had outlawed such indecency, but this only made the lewd picture industry move underground, where naturally, it flourished, especially in major cities. And if you knew where to go and how to ask for one, you could purchase something from the hidden menu. 
Kind of like when you go to McDonald's. Yeah, there's a hidden menu there too. Google it and see for yourself. I'd repeat what my favorite one is, but I would be in trouble from the YouTube gods. And I've been treading on thin ice this whole video, so. Uh, number four, the first counterculture. The 1960s were a very important time for many different people. Black Americans were fighting for the rights, music went from holding hands to strawberry fields, if you know what I'm saying, and everything that your parents told you just, just kind of felt wrong. If you grew up then, you know what I mean. I know people like to make fun of hippies, but there was some good ideas there. Well, in 1890s England, they were sort of having the same thing happen. Obviously, not as strong as a push as it was in the 60s, but still. Basically, after all the oppression towards bedroom relations, people began to open up. Uh, not literally, just, just open up thinking-wise. That's really gross, don't repeat that. There's only one way we all got here. Unless you're a test tube baby, of course. In that case, thank you for watching CT133576-2. To some historians, this makes sense. When you push and push for things to happen or ban, eventually people will push back, especially if it's something like bedroom time. Everybody, everybody likes a little bit of bedroom time. Valentine's Day wasn't too long ago. Remember that? It was good. It was fun. It was good, good fun. Number three, Jack the Ripper. While the man's numbers don't compare to any of the other horrible people in history, he's unusual because of his brutality and the fact that he was never caught. Jack the Ripper was maybe the first modern serial on a liver. He haunted the streets of Victorian London and is responsible for claiming multiple women's lives, women of the evening to be exact, and they began to know the name Jack the Ripper. Now we'll probably just have to show you pictures of Victorian London or maybe some b-roll of a shadowy figure because there ain't no way we can show the crime scenes. There's probably a dozen different theories on who done it. Some say it was multiple men using his name as an alias, some say it was Prince Albert, there's even some who suggest that he was a she, and which explains why women were so easy to go off with Jack. That actually kind of makes sense to me at least, and why no one really would be looking for a woman back then. Kind of makes sense. Anyway, be careful out there ladies, just, just be careful. Number two, Queen Victoria. It seems old blighty herself may have been a tad more promiscuous than you'd think a royal to be. Well, not with other men, but her husband who in her diary claims to be the love of her life, which honestly is kind of sweet and, and romantic, that's nice. One thing that I find interesting, however, is that while lewd images were outlawed, the queen may have commissioned a painting of herself that was quite risque for the time. To gift to her husband, of course. Hypocrisy much? I say lewd, but it was probably just in her loose-fitting clothes with maybe like an ankle showing or something. Still, unusual behavior for the queen. I'll remember that the next time, Bly. I'll remember that. Number one, Prince Albert. If you've ever stepped foot into a tattoo parlor, then you might know where I'm going with this. Prince Albert, the husband of Queen Victoria, had some controversy circulating his name. One, because he shares a name with another Prince Albert, who was speculated to be Jack the Ripper, but also because of a very unique piercing. Go ahead and take a guess where that piercing is. Yeah, I didn't think so. As a man, if your anatomy could be described by an internet comedian using moderately funny euphemisms, then the piercing would go through your German army helmet. That makes sense, right? The horror. The absolute horror. It's rumored that he had one of these piercings. Did he? Ah, I'm not sure. But if it means anything to you, Nicholas II had a tattoo, so it's not completely out of the realm of possibility. Number 10. No calling, no gifts. This is a time in history when men were told to be gentlemen and women told to be ladies. Naturally, that came with some weird social practices. For instance, women were discouraged from accepting gifts from men. Personally, I like to give my girlfriend flowers and chocolate. I'm a classic guy, what can I say? Can't go wrong with that. However, even if a handsome silver-tongued devil such as myself were to give some flowers and the finest dark chocolate a 7-Eleven has to offer, and a most promising woman were to accept said gifts, she may not be able to call me back. Literally because well, the phone isn't exactly a thing yet, and also because that's something else women were just discouraged from doing. Pfft. Call on a man? No way, Jose! Even if he is super nice and waiting for a genuine response. One etiquette guidebook from 1882 called any woman who calls on a man ill-bred and positively improper to do so. I like when people give me flowers and chocolate. Maybe call me sometimes, I'm a little lonely. Number nine, act like a lady. How dare ladies do anything unladylike? Oh, said every man ever in the Victorian era. This is a time in history when ladies gotta be ladylike. That means makeup, corsets, and, and don't you dare do anything masculine. Oh, that's me angry. This is still a time when food isn't the greatest either, so imagine if you got an upset tummy at the dinner table. Happens to me a lot. You've got a handsome prince that your parents have arranged for you to marry. When you go to greet him, you do it with a simple gesture as kneeling to curtsy 
could turn your linens a certain shade of embarrassment that 1800 stain cleaning technology could never wash away. You'd poop yourself. Where's Billy Mays when you need him, right? How dare a woman do such things as go number two, or even worse, break wind? Oh, the nerve. That's just the way it went, folks. I don't make the rules. Number eight, charged with love. Naturally, this was the past, and not being open to homosexuality was just the way it was. Especially when tucking yourself into bed at night alone wasn't allowed either. Homosexuality just wasn't gonna happen. They, they just weren't gonna be approved of it. It's just how it goes. It sucks. However, it's almost as if there's been love on this earth since day one, and to stop that kind of love, it's just silly, man. Wherever I go, everyone is welcome on this channel or my Twitch. Chetty loves everyone because in reality, this is a time period where you could wind up in jail for that kind of love. And as Awesome Powers would say, that's just not very groovy, baby. Yeah. Strangely enough, homosexual relationships between women might have been completely overlooked as they were sometimes mistaken for women being friends. Yeah, I know. Some women even lived together, but given that they probably needed each other for financial support, people just kind of thought that's how it went and they ignored it. It's like they live together and you start putting the pieces together and it's like, you know, they, I don't know, something weird going on there. But love everybody, come on, be nice. Number seven, a good thing. If I'm talking about medieval times, there's a good chance I'm gonna bring up the super not cool, not fun, do not condone or support the behavior of marrying a woman at the age of 12. Yucky. In part one, I mentioned that there was a ton of corners and streets being worked by the only other job besides street cleaners at 3 a.m. by women. However, after venereal disease was becoming a serious issue, it was getting pretty bad. It was becoming clear that a lot of people who were getting sick were young women, like 11 to 16 age group. Oof. Which I shouldn't have to tell you is bad. That, that's pretty bad, dude. When I was 16, I was rocking Black Ops 2, hanging out with my buddies, and partying hard in the summer. I got a lot of good stories. Maybe I'll share them one day. Catching all that nasty stuff is no way to spend your youth. So thank God the government changed the age of consent to 16 years old, which I know is not a solution for everything that was going on, but it was a small step forward in the right direction. That's what we like. Good history moving forward. We like that. Chetty likes. Number six, the seam seamstress. Being that the industrial revolution had started and business was booming, people needed to travel for business. Or more specifically, men needed to travel for business. Which means they gotta be away from their wives, and that means they are away from the very thing we're talking about today. Bedroom stuff. How did men solve this issue? Well, there was no shortage of ladies roaming street corners to uh, aid in, in that matter. However, there's an option with a little less syphilis. There were AIDS or early blow-up dolls called travel ladies. Strangely enough, it was stored in a gentleman's hat. What? That's so wrong. Once it was ready to be used, it was inflated and reassembled. This is a quote from an ad from one of the products. It is inflated to the essential part of the woman wanted by a man. That just, that just doesn't sound very good. This is why we have boards of people to check stuff from products before it gets shipped out to the public. I feel like that just wouldn't fly very well today. Number five. Big polluter. This just doesn't make any sense. It never did to me. And it still doesn't. But in case you didn't know, self-pleasure was a big no-no. Commonly called self-pollution. Which honestly is very funny to me. That's just hilarious. Don't self-pollute yourself, Chris. That's bad. Don't do that. That's naughty. It was a sin and thought to be a cause for many ailments. I'm sure you've heard the classic saying that for guys, if you decided to go bump in the night by yourself, there's a good chance you'd need a walking stick because it would make you go blind. Women were also targeted, however, as for any pearl polishing by women was thought to be hysteric and needed to be treated for such. Look, the truth is, any man who wants to wax his carrot or woman tuning a one dial radio should be able to do so without judgment of society or medical remedies of snake oil doctors. Love yourself, love everybody else, and just, as long as the bedroom door's closed, you're good. Just, just don't do it in public, you're good. Number four, shake and bake. I'm something of a scientist myself, but that doesn't mean I know everything, and if you actually need to learn something about health and safety, take it from a professional, not a second-rate John Candy. However, when coming across this fact, I just had to share it, because with my medical knowledge, this just doesn't sound right. All right, so, kids, we know how they're made. I don't need to go into detail for that. However, there was this idea back in the Victorian days that if a woman danced shortly after doing what mommy and daddies do, then there was a chance that her pregnancy just 
wouldn't happen. Or perhaps more commonly after riding a horse. S same idea, uh, okay. Which is frankly, horse. I mean, come on, my mom always told me when she was baking that I had to be quiet and stop running around the house or the cake she was baking wouldn't rise. Well, they always did and I love chocolate cake. I mean, really I do. I'm starting to wonder if there's a connection here. I was a rowdy kid. Number three, the Kensington system. Poor Queen Victoria. I know this is kind of a stretch, but it relates back to the whole mistreating women thing. But basically, it was something implemented in order to control the young royal, make her dependent on her mother, whom she was not allowed to be without. Basically, modern day strict parents. Now, all the kids watching right now, or all the kids who've grown up, how well did that parenting work? Let us know in the comments. I'm willing to bet it created a little bit of a divide between parent and child, am I right? That's exactly what happened with Queen Victoria. Shouldn't be surprised, really. Being a parent is tough. I get that. But squeeze too hard and the sand falls through the cracks of your hand. Victoria wasn't even allowed an hour to herself. And I don't care who you are, no matter how charismatic or bubbly, everybody needs some alone time. Number two, a healthy breakfast. Okay, not Victorian London, but this is just too funny not to mention, and it's around the same time period, very close. As the great minds of the time thought, self-pollution was a big no-no, and the reason for these urges was often related to food. Some thought eating meat would make you down bad, so a man named John Harvey Kellogg, you might have heard of him, aimed to cure the sickness of self-love. What if a man had a delicious, nutritious meal to eat, especially at the start of his day? Cornflakes! by Kellogg's, the, the very same cereal that's probably sitting on top of your fridge, yeah, was partially originally designed to stop you from feeling those carnal urges. Now, not sure if that works. I mean, go ahead and tell me how you feel after eating a bowl of that. I had one this morning. I feel fine. I don't feel any different at all. I mean, I'm just, well, not really feeling the same about Pam Anderson anymore, though. Number one, rising action. This could get some married couples into some trouble if they're watching. So sorry. It's gonna be hard to talk about this without saying it because YouTube will send a stern letter if I do, but here it goes. The deed was not considered done unless both parties had signed off on it, uh, had their toes curled. Reaching the peak, your magnum opus, the way I feel when I eat at McDonald's, DEFCON 1, or simply mispronouncing organisms in health class. I feel like once you're involved, you're involved. And to me, that's a done deal. You can't really reverse it from that point on, regardless of any of my euphemisms, but that's what they thought. They thought if you didn't, you both didn't climb that mountain together, it didn't happen. Cause science. Number 10 is chloroform the hiccups away. Nowadays we know a nasty case of hiccups is curable by just holding your breath or chugging a bunch of water. But if this was 1899, you'd be prescribed chloroform. Known by many as the mysterious liquid on the rag placed over the someone's face to make them faint in many period pieces or cartoons, chloroform gained popularity after Queen Victoria demanded its usage during her labor in 1853, after having been denied it in her previous labors. By taking these lengths to reduce the annoyance of hiccups, your vital organs may pay a steep price. Chloroform has the potential to damage the nervous system, lungs, and trachea, as well as the liver and kidney when exposed long term. This is just one of many medical remedies that we'll be covering from the first Merrick Manual of Diagnosis and Therapy, the oldest continuously published English language medical textbook. All the quack treatments in our list today used to be found in this mass encyclopedia. For instance, number 9 in our countdown is smoke inhalation for asthma and other lung conditions. This may be one of the more counterintuitive remedies on our list, as it's easy to see now that smoke is not beneficial for asthma at all. Through the late 19th and into the next, however, inhaling smoke or smoke, as well as stramonium, a hallucination inducing nightshade, as well as lobelia, known for its sedative properties, were popular treatments for asthmatics. Asthma is caused when your airways can narrow or swell while producing excess mucus. Smoking, meanwhile, has been shown to eventually reduce the number of cilia, the lungs filaments which help transport mucus into the lungs, which only leads to the worsening of asthma symptoms. This wasn't the only weird tobacco smoke belief, however, in 1872, an English newspaper talked of tobacco smoke enemas which even reported that hundreds of lives might have been spared by the tobacco smoke enema. Okay, 
Weird enough. Plasters, no not the British word for band-aids, is number 8. This medical treatment was said to have sucked the badness out of a person. They were like a nicotine patch made up of a thin layer sheet of wax as well as leather and it was able to stick onto the skin. In the wax there were remedies such as lead, opium, frankincense, tobacco, etc. This mix would be applied while still warm to ensure the adhesion of the plaster. Plasters were sold to anyone of any age and came in many different shapes and sizes so that they may be applied to different areas. What were they used for? Everything. Cough, cold, period pain, organ failure, alcoholism, headache, the list can go on forever. Seeing as they wanted the patch to pull as much badness from the body as possible, these patches could be left on for two days to two weeks to forever. Without washing, of course. Naturally, these patches trapped in a lot of moisture that could cause infections, blisters, rashes, and hives underneath, especially once the patch is removed and the skin is finally exposed to air. Arsenic, like plasters, was a cure all, and it's number seven in the countdown. If you've seen our other video, Top 10 Unusual Fashion Trends from the Victorian Era, you might know that arsenic was in everything in the Victorian era. Makeup, wallpaper, dye. No exception was made in medicine either as arsenic was prescribed for anything from anemia in Merrick's diagnosis manual to anthrax, cancer, reduced libido, syphilis, or even cholera. While it was most popular to consume arsenic, it could also be inhaled or injected. Being a byproduct of smelting, it's no wonder arsenic was everywhere during the industrial revolution as there was an excess of it. So it was incredibly accessible and a household remedy. Since doctors already prescribed it to do so much, everyday people just start to use it to treat any common ailment. Unsurprisingly, many people suffered arsenic poisoning symptoms. The ailments are now referred to as Fowler's disease. Number six is all kinds of gross and questionable. The everlasting pill. When the Merck manual was first published, part of the comprehensive treatment plan for an eruptive fever, which is a classification for diseases like scarlet fever, smallpox, and chickenpox, was actually laxatives. Castor oil was the main laxative choice for Victorians up until the debut of the everlasting pill, made up of a metal now known to be toxic called antimony, would be invented. Swallowing this would induce severe vomiting and diarrhea, thus giving the body what they thought to be a healthy cleanse, and their intention was to purge diseases from the body. It earned the name the everlasting pill, as the pill would pass through the gastric system mostly intact, meaning it could be retrieved and cleaned for future use. Seeing as the metal was greatly valuable at the time, it was quite common to keep it in the family and hand it down generation to generation. Imagine getting that in your granny's will. Watch out, it may shock ya. Number five is shock treatment. When profit can be made off of insecurity, unsavory business flourishes. Victorians honed in on the man's moral weaknesses as a cause for erectile dysfunction, and impotence was thought to be caused by either too much sex and masturbation or not enough. So doctors took a few shocking routes, literally, such as galvantic baths or bathtubs filled with electrodes, which were supposed to restore sexual desire in an advertised six sessions. For a more direct approach, a thin rod with running electric current could be placed up into a man's ear. Repeat that twice a week, about five minutes each time, and your little man should be ready to rumble. By the late 1800s, ads were running for electric belts aimed at weak men. They claimed to help cure kidney pain and sciatic nerve issues and backaches and headaches and nervous exhaustion, and of course, mainly their dysfunction. While today impotence is recognized as the result of physical or mental duress, age, or genetics, the belief that electric shock therapy is a useful cure for impotence still persists, and some studies have shown positive signs. See that, fellas? Don't knock it till you try it. Speaking of electrocuting genitals, you can't tell me that didn't happen at least once with the first electric vibrators, which is number four in our countdown. Female hysteria became a diagnosable medical condition way back in medieval times when the concept of a wandering uterus, when a discontented or displaced uterus would cause a woman ill health, was first coined. Believed to have symptoms such as irritability, insomnia, fainting, anxiety, menstruation, or horniness, pretty much every woman showed these symptoms. Hysteria was pretty common. Doctors cure hysterical paroxysm and orgasm. For hundreds of years leading up to this invention, doctors were manually administering pelvic massages to women to achieve the necessary cure. But all that wrist work added up over time and doctors needed a break. So cue Dr. Joseph Mortimer Granville. He created an electric steam powered electromechanical medical instrument nicknamed the manipulator. The device allowed women to give themselves home massages to cure their wandering wounds 
wombs and giving doctors the well deserved break they needed. A questionable cure for a very questionable diagnosis. Number three is not for the faint of heart. They loved leeches. It may be crazy to imagine, but between the late 1700s and well into the early 1900s, there was a booming leech trade all across Europe. Leeches were shipped from Germany to America by the tens of thousands. England even had to start importing them from France by the mid 1800s as their own leech stocks were not even enough to supply their own doctors. Francis Bressoyas believed that all diseases resulted from the excess buildup of blood and documented this belief in a medical journal that would subsequently cause leeches to become the go to treatment in France and then later spread across Europe. This usage of leeches then became worldwide from there and so obscene that the creatures started to go extinct. However, what these quacks didn't know is that bloodletting was very, very, very rarely beneficial to any conditions and applying leeches often resulted in detrimental side effects such as blood loss, diarrhea and vomiting or those with poor immune systems could even be exposed to hazardous bacteria and infection. Let alone death from hemorrhagic shock for literally anyone they did this to. Eventually the excessive use of leeches meant that they became too expensive to ship, too scarce due to the over farming to find, and medically obsolete in the face of new science that questioned the medical merits of bloodletting. Thank god. Number 2 doesn't allow you to touch where number 1 usually comes out. It's the masturbatory mental illness. Obviously it's natural, normal and well fun, but the Victorian perspective of masturbation was nowhere near what it is today. As our old timely friends saw it as a serious threat to mental and physical health or even could kill you. Self love was seen as an ultimate evil, but beyond moralistic arguments many physicians thought that every orgasm drained a mans energy. Married men were warned by doctors to limit the amount of sex they were having, while unmarried men were encouraged and urged to conserve their essence by avoiding sex altogether, particularly masturbation. Even wet dreams and uncontrolled ejaculation were considered a sexual dysfunction function as masturbation essentially became the male version of hysteria. So how did you treat this condition? Men had to stop masturbating. Fear and shame campaigns did what they do best and stimulated the market to provide quick quack remedies. They came in the form of anti-masturbation devices that looked like torture chambers. Most popular was the jugum, which was a metal ring attached around the base of a man's, you know, and then screwed on. If he was to become erect at any point, whether awake or asleep, the now inflated skin would make contact with sharp metal teeth that would dig in. Like I said, most popular. Consider how much worse these other options were for that to be the primo choice. A spermatic truss was essentially the first jock strap, but meant for every day. And the Bowden device fastened a little metal helmet to the end of a man's member that bound up into his pubic hair so that it would be ripped out should he become erect. I'm more than happy to keep going, but I'm sure more than enough people are wincing right now. Keep in mind, while these men were going through this to avoid masturbation, women were being prescribed it as a cure. Number one on our countdown may be a bit of a surprise. Surgery. How could surgery be a questionable treatment? Well, it itself isn't, but the men performing it and their hygiene towards surgery were. Most famous is Robert Liston. Said to be able to remove a leg in 30 seconds, he notoriously used his own mouth to hold scalpels, knives, and even once sucked the pus out of a woman's throat wound. According to medical historian Dr. Lindsay Fitzharris, surgeons never washed their instruments or their hands, and Victorian surgeons were known for wearing old surgery garments out of prowess, reportedly so stiff with old blood that they were nearly cardboard in appearance. Even the operating tables themselves were rarely washed down, and it was said a visitor to St. George's Hospital in London 1825 discovered mushrooms and maggots thriving in the damp, dirty sheets of a patient's bed. When asked why they hadn't complained, the patient assumed this to be the norm. And what about surgery in the moment? Well, the patients were conscious and undrugged as they were operated on, and surgeries needed to be fast as a result. One in four people died after their surgery, whether it was still on the operating table or from infections afterwards. But what about our buddy I mentioned, Dr. Liston? Only 1 in 10 of his patients die. This was because of his speed. Time me gentlemen, time me, he'd shout to the surgery spectators to put his legendary speed to the test. Sure, he did accidentally castrate somebody once because of his wild motions, but nobody's perfect. In fact, while he's remembered for being the first surgeon to use anesthesia, wash his knives, and invent a still used medical tool, he is the only surgeon to ever 
never have a 300% death rate. I'd be remiss not to mention that during a leg amputation, his lightning speed reportedly cut off three fingers of the assistant who had been holding down the patient. Then, as he brought the knife back up, he slashed the coat of a spectator. The spectator reportedly died immediately of fright, likely a heart attack. Though the assistant and patient survived initially, like most who were treated in Victorian hospitals, they died not long after from infection, which was also just called hospitalism at the time because of how many people died that way. It's easy to say that going to a Victorian surgery or a hospital may have been as efficient as rubbing dirt into a wound. Number 10, knocker upper. All right, sounds a little different than its actual purpose. Hear me out. Alarm clocks, they're not great, right? They suck, no doubt about it. Now take the alarm clock and assign that job to a real life person. What does that look like? What does that sound like, rather? at 6 a.m. That person is called a knocker upper, a person employed solely to wake up workers at mills and factories on those early morning shifts. Now, going from house to house, using a long pole to knock on bedroom windows, that sounds like the best job ever, right? I can't close the list with this one. This is number 10, for sure, it's kind of fun. If you had this job, well, you're probably not alive anymore. I don't know, unless you live in a weird town. The people at the time were a lot friendlier back then than they are now, so, you know, I'm sure the knocker upper came around today, be a little different. They'd probably be on World Star the next day. Knocker upper is back in the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for waking me up. I would have lost $14. Thank you. It was a big deal. It was definitely a big deal. Number nine. The Linkerman. Before the introduction of gas lights on the streets of London, if you were traveling alone at night, well, you'd probably get lost. Because, yeah, even London now would get lost, you know what I mean? So that's where a Linkerman would ideally come into play. They'd come in to save your night. What they would do is they would carry with them a torch to help guide your way home. They'd be like, hey, follow me, I know these streets, and then you'd do it, I guess? It's a little scary. At the end of this impromptu tour, they'd of course expect a little tip from you. Of course, of course, thank you for lighting my path and getting me home, cheers. Here's one nickel, it's actually a lot back then. Here's one penny, there we go. They weren't so bad, they were generally pretty helpful in getting you from point A to B, whilst also being able to see one foot in front of the other, that doesn't hurt, especially in Victorian London. You gotta step on a dirty rat, that'll be gross. It's like a friend walking you home, only you don't know them, and it's the Victorian era, so probably pretty unsafe. 50-50 if you're gonna make it. And their charge was usually one farthing or the equivalent of a quarter. The linker man, like a lot of the jobs on this list, was actually featured in a lot of art and literature from that era. And there were even a couple famous linker men, famous linker mans, like Lawrence Casey, for example, who was the personal linker boy for the courtesan Betty Careless. Imagine that, your arm must be so strong with that lamp all day. Ooh, it's just like, oh, I can't put it down. Number eight, ghost photography. 1800s ghost photography. Apparently it was a theme or a, a vibe, I don't know, but there were people that would take the photos of these ghosts. So at one point you would be hired as a professional ghost photographer. On paper, here's your tax returns. That's what I did. The camera, of course, was a hot new invention back then. So tales of ghost and spirit were easily believed, especially when you have a photo of a see-through woman. That probably helps sell your tail for sure. Like, up oh, here she is. It's like, that's that's mom. That's definitely not, you just did that in the back room. That's, I don't believe you. A big name in the ghost game was that of William Thomas Stead. He was born in 1849, so now he's for sure a ghost. Stead was the son of a Congregationalist minister, and at the age of 22, he was appointed as editor of the Northern Echo, which was a regional newspaper in Darlington. Yeah, this British medium, Richard Borsonal, featured a photo of W.T. Stead and a spirit. Imagine that, imagine a day where somebody was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize and they also posed for photo ops with ghosts. Like, can we pick a lane, science or not? What are we doing here? Number seven, grave designs. Graves, but make them cool, you know? Customize your own pit in the ground. That's fun, that's grim. In the late 1700s, cholera, bacterial infections, pretty much anything floating around your mouth and eyes, it was spreading and it was bad. Not a good thing to ingest. Not an ideal time in history. Many were biting the bullet at this time, of course, being gravely ill. But with this came a dark new fun trend. Yeah, here we go. The safety coffin. Yeah, let's uh, make your own coffin, DIY. These coffins, God forbid, you were buried alive while these safety coffins would allow the dead to rise again. Yeah, some Tony Stark guy in the back's like, if you push this, the body will pop back out and come to life. It's like, really? A lot of these coffins were built with extra comfort on the inside and of course, a wire, the safety backup wire. This wire ran through the coffin, through the ground, and attached to a bell on the outside on the ground. So if somebody was walking by and they heard a bell ringing beside a gravestone, first of all, it's haunting, well, they know that something's up and they can get them out. 
But folks would get creative with their safety coffins. They would ask the inventor to make them crazy things, like a man named Robert Robinson from Manchester. He had some odd requests. He passed away in 1791, but he instructed his family and watchmen to open the special door on his coffin after he passed. The special door would reveal a layer of glass. Yeah, so if anybody saw any condensation, well, you know, he's still alive and get him out. Only he wasn't alive. And now we just have the world's scariest exhibit. Just a real life dead man. Let's close that back up forever. I don't want a glass coffin, that's disgusting. Number six, rat catcher. I mean, obviously you know what's gonna happen with the name the rat catcher. It's gonna make a lot of you out there squirm in your seats and I apologize in advance. Hit that thumbs up, you know, let's even out the energy. Rats in Victorian England, they were a massive problem. They were everywhere. Every nook and cranny of your home probably had a dirty, fat rat just sitting there with its weird teeth looking at you. From the basement to the pipes, everywhere. It was literally a, it was a big problem. There was even an account of them spilling over from royal parks. So imagine that. So of course, there's a problem. So of course, where there's a problem, there's now a job, right? Someone's got to do something about it. Rat catchers were pretty famous throughout the Victorian era. I mean, of course, brave souls. And they were highly praised in society, but the job, obviously, wasn't too glamorous. You'd be going into dark, dirty places where rats would make their homes and we'd catch them and you'd often have to kill thousands of rats every single year. And then deal with that. I don't even know how you deal with those bodies. Let's say bones, ew. More often than not, rat catchers would use other animals like dogs and ferrets to help them hunt down the rats, so. You have your own little animal posse hunting down other animals. You would feel pretty good. You'd feel like a, the king of animals almost. Probably not, eh? It's probably a disgusting job. You probably hate it every day. Number five, matchstick makers. The idea of a lighter wasn't really a big thing back in the Victorian era, obviously. I mean, they definitely existed. The first lighter was invented in 1823, but it wasn't like the ones we have now. Not like those Bix that still don't work. It wasn't a portable thing. The first match was invented in 1805, but it kind of sucked. And the first friction activated match came around much later in 18. 1926. This one here changed the game for good. They were made with white phosphorus, which is, of course, extremely toxic. But they didn't have machines to make these matches. No, it was, of course, done by people, young women. It was only women that had to do this, and in the worst of conditions, of course. And before you ask, no, they didn't understand protective gear. Well, they did a bit, but even so, women didn't get that kind of luxury, right? They didn't get that treatment. These girls would have to eat their lunch at their workstations, meaning they would probably end up ingesting said white phosphorus the entire shift. History is horrible. Number four, resurrectionalist. All right, back in the day, medical schools who wished to study the human body only really had access to the bodies of criminals who had hit the end of their line, right? You're not gonna go dig up someone's wife and be like, hey, mind if I study her? He's like, no, please. There actually weren't too many of these bodies around to begin with, which led to a good price for bodies that were in, well, reasonably good condition to, you know, study up close, other than being, you know, deceased and disgusting. This wasn't exactly the greatest idea, sure, I'll admit that. Now you've probably created an opportunity for people with no morals or empathy to go and dig up fresh graves. And that's exactly what happened. People would become their own resurrectionalist. It's a cool name for a god-awful profession if you want to call it that. The problem was so bad that people had to protect, like they had to guard the graves of their recently deceased loved ones. Or else these guys would come in and try and dig them up and sell your Nana for like 20 bucks. You have to stay there for four nights and guard her. That's great. No one should have to do that. The Victorian era sucked. No one should have to do that or this next one here. Number three, train engine cleaner. Yeah, this one's gonna suck. It sounds yucky already. For this job, you were required to get into, of course, pretty tough positions to, well, clean the engine of a train. Train engine cleaners would have to get inside a small hole in the engine of a train and shovel out all that coal that was left over. Yeah, as if shoveling the coal in wasn't bad enough, now some guy's gotta crawl under and shovel it all out. Nope. They go underneath the train with a dusty ash pan and they work away all day long and nights. These guys would spend their days shoveling five to six tons of coal into the furnace of the steam trains and then spend their nights climbing into the same furnace to clean it out. Every time I watch the Polar Express, it's always so magical, you know, it's always a great time. But even on the Polar Express, there's a guy shoveling coal all night long on Christmas Eve. You know what I mean? That's how bad this job is. Magic can't even save it. Couldn't even picture a worse job to have with this goofy back. Imagine that, imagine me doing this all day. No way, I'm gonna make it one week. Number two, funeral mute. Ah uh, yes, death. Happened quite a lot back then. I thought being a pallbearer had a lot of pressure, you know, don't drop them, hmm? all that kind of stuff. Victorian London saw many, many funeral mutes. Now Oliver Twist, one of the lousy jobs in that tale was that of a funeral mute. All of her twists is like, this one sucks. This one really sucks. Mutes were required to dress, of course, in all black with a sash while carrying a long cloth covered stick and your job would be to, well, to stand and mourn and not say a thing the entire time. You'd have to stand at the door of the recently deceased home and just welcome death. 
just embrace it. You have to be death. The mascot for death is now you. Horrible. In Victoria, London too, you're gonna breathe in a fresh, rotting body. Nice, that's good. I have about four days left, thank you. And after that point, you would lead the coffin all the way to the graveyard, nice and slow, like you're uh, leading a marching band. Only it's not music, it's death behind you. And finally, number one, a chimney sweep. I remember doing this when I was a kid. Okay, I got some questions now. I'm gonna make some phone calls after this list. I had to do this when I was a kid, but back then it was a lot worse. It wasn't a chore, it was an actual job. This was a terrible job to have in Victorian London, obviously. Chimney sweeps were famously young men. Guys, I can't say anything else here, but they were young lads. That's it. History is pretty horrible, right? You could fill it in. 1840 was a good year, all things considered, because a law was passed that made it officially illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to climb in and clean a chimney. Nice, I was 18 cleaning my chimney at home. I had no idea, I could have busted out this law and been like, actually, three more years, dad. See ya, just moonwalk out of there. I'm not cleaning anything, just the kitchen for now. I'm not using that tiny little brush. Why do all chimney sweeps have a tiny brush? Give them a bigger brush, you know? Number 10, moving in. I don't know about you guys, but when I think of Old Blighty, I think of Royal Prestige. London and Buckingham Palace. After all, that's what a queen needs. You gotta have a palace. Where's my palace? Although most people think of the queen living in Buckingham Palace, Queen Victoria was the first of the royal family to do so. I'm not royalty, but I wouldn't mind crashing a few days there. Nice big place, servants, probably all you can eat. Man, she had it good. All that's missing is Wi-Fi. Move over, your royal highness, I'm moving in. Just gotta get my collection of Sailor Moon memorabilia. Number nine, queen jeans. No, not a nice pair of royal jeans. I'm talking about DNA and hereditary jeans. I've mentioned a few times on this channel how the royal family may or may not have been uh, inbreeding. Okay, who am I kidding? There was a lot of inbreeding going on. Sisters, brothers, mothers, fathers, cousins, and of course, hey, step bro. Now, as lovely as that seems to some, unfortunately, crossing the hall to reproduce can have ill effects as inbreeding is known to have complications with birth and their offspring. Well, Queen Victoria may have been the first carrier of hemophilia B, a blood clotting disease. While not having it herself, it's thought she passed it down through royals related all throughout Europe. Tsar Nicholas II's son comes to mind. However, I feel like if we told the royals why people were contracting certain illnesses, they would still do what they want anyway. So, I'll just close the Door. You guys can go ahead and do what you're gonna do. <sighs> Number eight, breaking tradition. For men in Western culture, it has been a long time of bending the knee to propose to the woman that you love. Or so wish to swoon. Tammy Lynn, I don't got much, but I know I got this ring I found behind a Chuck E. Cheese. So what I would like to do is I Jim Bob Billy Habernathy, I'm asking for your hand in marriage. So romantic. Anyway, bad jokes aside, you'd be wrong in thinking that's how it went for old Blighty. When the young monarch met her cousin, Albert, the love juices were flowing. She knew she was gonna have to lock him in and propose to him before he could get the chance. They were shortly married soon after, and as stated in her diaries, it seemed that the couple was truly in love, which for royals is kind of rare. Even today, it's usually men who propose to ladies, but all I'm gonna say is, ladies, I'm 300 pounds of twisted steel and sex appeal, and I put the toothpaste lid back on after brushing my teeth, so, huh? Huh? Number seven, did you miss me? Queen Victoria was a leader. She held a lot of power, and that means people sometimes got a little crazy and wanted to remove her from such power. So for Queen Victoria, it should be no surprise, however uncouth it was, but she had multiple assassination attempts on her life. A lot of which were people firing shots at her carriage for some reason, with, with a pistol. I, and a lot of these attempts leading people to being declared insane. And one specific amateur who tried multiple times to end the royal and failed every time. Eight times to be specific. I feel like after the first four times when the guard saw this guy approach, it was like, oh, man, this guy again. Oh brother, this guy stinks! Anyway, all attempts and her life failed and she became the second longest reigning queen. Next to Queen Elizabeth, of course. Number six, oh Christmas tree, oh Christmas tree. I was honestly shooketh when I learned this, but you know that thing a lot of people do around the holiday season where they get a big green tree and they like decorate it because of the holiday called like Christmas? I mean, you might've heard of it. Yeah, I've never heard of it either. Bad jokes aside, the queen and her husband may have popularized the Christmas tradition of decorating the tree after sending trees to local schools and army barracks. An image of the family decorating the tree was also published that Christmas. I wonder if they popularized
realize any other traditions as well. Like your aunt drinking too much wine. And that one uncle, no matter how many times he's told, says something at the dinner table that would have him sitting in HR so fast that, well, he'd, he'd be sitting in the HR office for saying something like that in public. Everyone's got an uncle like that. Number five, the terror of London. If you're into serial killers and just a little goth or emo, I mean, who isn't, then you know who Jack the Ripper is. If you don't, he was a serial killer who roamed the streets of Victorian England and killed multiple women of the evening in what can be called the first, or one of the first, modern serial killers. Jack the Ripper, however, is one of the psychos who got away. No one is 100% sure on who the Terror of London was. However, that hasn't stopped people from theorizing on his or her true identity. No, not Queen Victoria herself, although there are some who believe he was a woman, which would explain how he got away so easily. However, another popular theory is that it was the Queen Victoria's grandson, Prince Albert Victor. While there isn't much evidence to support this claim or any of the claims really, it is interesting and makes me wonder, maybe the royal was a killer? We'll never know. Number four, short kings unite. Even though I'm a semi-charming and moderately handsome internet host, I suffer from an illness a lot of men do. I suffer from shortness. When the Lord was making me, he just put a few extra drops of cute in the mix. <sighs> and then there was no more room for my legs to grow. I just see life from a little bit down below. Although, I own it, and thank God I don't have little man syndrome. All toxic jokes aside, Queen Victoria may have been a good fit for us short kings, as she was barely five feet tall. She's known for being a formidable queen, but when you're that short, it can sometimes be difficult to keep your stature. Somebody take me seriously. Number three, dollies. Okay, so maybe my Sailor Moon merch collection is weird. Maybe I just wanna be a cute blonde Japanese girl with a short skirt fighting evil. <laughs> Can you blame me? However, something I always find strange, no matter who it is and who owns it, is a doll collection. Why? Just why? And it's never a couple. It's always a large collection. And tell me why anytime you go to visit someone and stay overnight, they always put you in a guest room when the majority of the dolls reside. There's nothing like a hundred pair of creepy plastic eyes staring you down while you're trying to sleep in a bed that isn't yours. Well, Her Royal Majesty had her own collection of dolls. Yeah, that's right. You can just imagine the kind of treatment these dolls received. It's said she had hundreds of them and most likely wore higher quality clothes than most common folk at the time. Great, now my worst nightmares outnumber me and they're dressed to the nines. Whew, dolls are just creepy. Number two, here comes the bride. Imagine being so powerful, so mighty, and influential that you'll create two Western traditions. Sure, the Christmas tree is great, but I'd argue the white wedding dress is more. She wasn't the first to wear a white wedding dress, but she was the one that made it happen. There's a few reasons why, and the obvious one is flexing that royal coin, but imagine trying to keep pure white clothes clean in the past. My mom makes a mean spaghetti and meatballs, and I have a difficult time keeping those stains off my white t-shirts, which, if you also ask my mom, is a bad color for me. I was a messy kid. That's why other colors at the time made sense. After all, there's no dry cleaning in the 1800s, at least not with modern machines and stain remover. Hey Alexa, can you add stain remover to my list? Number one, send lewds. Despite being known as a somewhat prudent queen, apparently the queen had an eye for the art that was lewd. In one case, the royal husband and wife gave each other art. She got some nice work, and uh, he got some nice works, if you catch my drift. We all know how nudity and lewd imagery can be treated by those who wish to censor it. Queen Victoria felt the opposite and had somewhat of an appreciation for the human form, even commissioning a lewd painting of herself. At least lewd for the time. It was more like a wrist and ankles kind of thing, but you know. At number 10, death photography. Has anyone out there looked at really old photos and had that eerie thought that everyone in that photo is dead now? I have. I know it sounds kind of weird, but it's just something that comes to mind sometimes. Back in the Victorian era though, they really had that thought because death photography became a trend at the time. Back then, people were dropping like flies. They dealt with a lot of illnesses like measles, scarlet fever, diphtheria, rubella, typhus, and cholera. Death was all around them, but with the rise of photography, this became a new way of keeping a memento of their loved one who passed away. Before this, they would keep locks of hair and other items from their loved ones, but once they got access to cameras, families started posing with their dead relatives. Literally. Families would often keep the bodies of their dead loved one in the house for days after their passing in order to have that mourning period, but soon they started staging photo shoots with the remains of their relatives, posing them and dressing them up to make it look like they're still alive. 
Family members would take pictures with the deceased to have one last family portrait before burying their loved one. It's kind of heartwarming in a way, but also really creepy. At number 9, Emigration. During the Victorian era, there was unfortunately a lot of orphan children living in the streets of London. It became a pretty big problem because of the sheer amount of young people without homes or families. It was estimated that around 30,000 children were living on the streets in London in 1869. Soon a program was put into place to try and solve this issue and people started rounding up these orphan kids and shipping them off elsewhere to work in some of the British colonies. Many of the kids who were shipped off ended up working as farmhands or as domestic servants. Though many children were shipped off to places like New Zealand and Australia, the majority of them went to Canada. About 80,000 of them actually. They were sent away with hopes that they would be able to live better lives, but unfortunately for many of those kids, they didn't end up having any better luck in compared to when they lived on the streets. This practice ended up becoming pretty controversial as you can imagine. Before we carry on talking about the strange things that happened in the Victorian era, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Mental Health Back in the Victorian era, the study of the human brain and psyche was still relatively new, so no one really knew what was going on up in people's noggins. Mental asylums started to pop up, and people started getting diagnosed with mental problems, even if the diagnosis wasn't accurate. The three labels that a patient could fall under were the manic, the melancholic, and those with dementia. The symptoms for those big three labels often varied, and people were admitted to asylums for some pretty messed up reasons. There was a list of common causes for mental illness that people referred to back then, and it included things like, quote, laziness, novel reading, superstition, an immoral life, and intemperance, as well as the act of self-pleasuring. For women, they could also be sent to asylums for some pretty ridiculous reasons, like imaginary female trouble, hysteria, rumor of husband murder, and even fits of desertion of husband. I am so glad things have changed since then. At number 7, Grave Robber When you think of jobs back in the Victorian era, you might think of things like chimney sweeps and lawyers. But another relatively popular, though questionable, profession was being a grave robber. Yes, people actually made a living off robbing graves. As people studied medicine, they needed cadavers to practice on, but there was a law saying that only the bodies of those who had been executed for a crime could be used as a cadaver, and since the laws changed to include less and less crimes having death penalties, soon people started running out of cadavers to practice on, and this gave way to the boom in the grave robbing industry. People can make a pretty penny for snatching bodies from cemeteries and selling them to medical professionals and students. Fresher bodies went for more money, and the grave robbers not only made money off the sale of the cadaver, but they also charged a fee, so they ended up with a little extra cash in their pockets. Eventually, the grave robbing business became such a big problem that cemeteries started installing watchtowers and guards to prevent people from getting away with the dead. At number 6, Beauty I've talked about this before in some past videos, but the Victorian era was famous for its strange beauty practices, so I just had to include it on this list. You're probably familiar with the makeup from the Victorian era. Women often painted their faces white to look as pale as possible, but even though they believed it made them look beautiful, it also did a lot of harm to their health. The white face paint that women would use was lead based, and as we all by now, lead makes you dead. But this white lead paint isn't the only thing that harmed people's skin. Women would also wash their faces with ammonia to make their skin look paler. At night, women would rub opium on their faces, and if they were really dedicated to their beauty regime, they would also ingest arsenic. They were literally poisoning themselves in the name of beauty. Women would also use mercury on their eyebrows and eyelashes, and would use lemon juice or belladonna in their eyes, which could cause blindness in some people. Once again, I'm glad things have changed. At number 5, no divorce. Nowadays, divorce is quite common. All you have to do is sign a paper and you're done. But back in the Victorian era, before the Matrimonial Causes Act of 1857 allowed divorce, people had to find different ways of getting rid of their spouses. After all, just because there was no divorce doesn't mean that everyone was happy in their marriages. It turns out that in order to solve their problems and get rid of their spouse, people would just sell their wives, either in public or in private sales. Most of the time, a man would take his wife to the town square and just sell her off to a new man. According to some records, some women had the power to veto a sale, and sometimes it was for cash. Though I think the cheapest that a wife was ever sold for was a pint of beer. 
This wasn't necessarily bad for the woman because if she was sold to someone else, things could sometimes work out and she could live a better life with a better spouse. And if she didn't, then she would just get sold again and get to try her luck with a new man. At number four, food additives. These days, people are becoming more and more concerned with artificial additives in their food. All natural, organic, pesticide, and hormone free food is becoming more and more popular, but back in the Victorian era, people were putting all kinds of additives in their noms, and a lot of it was really, really bad for you. Like, we're talking deadly. Chalk and alum were often added to bread dough to make it whiter, and sometimes pipe clay, plaster of Paris, or sawdust was added to the mix as well. Red lead was sometimes added to cheese, lead was added to cider, mustard, wine, sugars, and candies, copper sulfates were used in preserving fruits, jams, and wine, mercury was used in candies, and even ice cream was made using a water and chalk mixture. All of these unsafe ingredients are actually what prompted the food safety industry because no matter what's going on, you shouldn't be eating lead, chalk, and mercury. At number three, corpse medicine. Now earlier I mentioned the whole grave robber industry and how that really took off during the Victorian era, but now let's talk about how they used corpses in their medicine. Back then, some people believed that consuming certain parts of the human body could cure their ailments. I know. Gross, right? One of the more popular medicines back then was a mixture made with human skull and chocolate, and it was believed to cure apoplexy. Back in the Victorian era, medical texts were published describing what parts of the human body could be used to treat specific ailments. One text described mixing the skull of a young woman with treacle to treat epilepsy. Another text says that you could treat paralysis with a candle made of human fat. Apparently, executioners were linked to this type of medicine as they would, you know, execute someone and then use the remains to become a doctor and treat people's illnesses. Imagine Grey's Anatomy, but with Victorian medicine. Sounds like an interesting thing to watch, but also probably not to experience. At number two, mummies. Speaking of dead people though, people from the Victorian era were oddly fascinated with mummies. I mean, I can understand the fascination to a certain extent because they're old and cool, but of course, these people just had to be extra weird and take that obsession with mummies to heights that they didn't need to be. People used ground up mummies to make paint, Pieces of mummies were sold in jars, and they were even used in advertising. One candy shop put a mummy on display in the store, claiming that it was the daughter of a pharaoh who saved baby Moses. I mean, that's weird, right? I understand that this was all happening as archaeologists were starting to uncover lost treasures and secrets from Egypt, but I mean, a mummy in a candy shop? Seems a little much. And finally at number one, baby farmers. Now for what I believe is probably the most disturbing thing from the Victorian era, baby farmers. Basically, this was an industry of women who would take unwanted babies and either take care of them, give them to new parents, or unfortunately have them disposed of. One famous case of the darker side of baby farmers comes from a woman named Amelia Dyer. She was known to have charged women a lot of money to take their babies off their hands, but unfortunately the children wouldn't survive Amelia's care. It is believed that Amelia was responsible for the passings of hundreds of babies, making her one of the biggest monsters of the Victorian era. Getting us started at number 10 is top hats. A top hat is an iconic image. You can see them in old black and white movies or on logos such as Mr. Peanut. But why were top hats created and why were they so trendy? Well, there's multiple reasons actually. Men and women were already wearing hats and bonnets to protect their heads from rain, wind, and the soot from local smokestacks. As a result, hats were already quite a trendy wear. However, the true reason for its popularity is what it represented. The top hat quickly became symbolic of status, power, and masculinity. From 1850 to 1900, men wore top hats for business, pleasure, and formal occasions. Certain colors were even associated with certain times of day. For example, a black top hat was for day or night, making its wear feel taller, more handsome, even suave. Some were even reported to be a height of 12 to 14 inches tall. Top hats, amongst other hats of this era, also required ridiculous upkeep, such as being brushed, boiled regularly, powdered, etc. They also tend to contain mercury poison. As time progressed, we found other ways to overcompensate as well as accessorize our heads, so it's easier to see why the top hat never made a comeback. Number nine in the countdown is women and their flirty fans. When you see a gentleman caller across the room, you may want to send him a hint that you're picking up the vibe that his top hat is putting out. What better way than sublimial messaging with an item you're already carrying? In Victorian times, women carried fans due to fainting spells, which were really just the result of their excessively tight and heavy garments, something we'll cover later 
later in the video. In 1827, a fan maker from Paris, Doubleroy, published a leaflet explaining the language behind the uses of a fan. Some examples were twirling the fan in the right hand meant that I love another. Meanwhile, drawing the fan across the cheek told someone special that I love you. A fan half opened and pressed to the lips gave permission for a kiss. However, it is rumored that the less romantic truth is that the fan etiquette, such as Duvalroy's leaflet, was invented in order to boost the sales of fans in the 19th century after they had fallen out of fashion following the French Revolution. Irregardless of rumors, it appears in olden times some people were using fans to get hot rather than cool down. Speaking of keeping it cool, next in our countdown at number 8 is bottomless underwear. While showing a bit of ankle may have made you a harlot, in the Victorian era every woman was walking around with crotchless undergarments. But these strange underoos were invented with a justified purpose. Due to the amount of fabric layers, steel crinolines, and tight bodices and dresses, women of the era didn't really have time to spend an hour undressing before nature calls. By creating undergarments that had holes aligned with the wearer's groin, a woman's only mission would be to hoist up as many layers as she could before popping a squat. Don't be fooled however, that wasn't exactly easy either. Some of you may wonder, what happened if Aunt Flo paid a visit while a woman was wearing an open bottom undergarment? Well, in Victorian times, menstruation hygiene was perceived very different and women quite literally let it flow. If you want to learn more, search that one up on your own. As fashion evolved and women wore fewer and lighter clothes in the early 20th century, pulling down undergarments from underneath bustles and cages was no longer a nightmare, so the crotchless undergarment was soon abandoned once more. But now it does make sense why everyone loved the high kicking can can dancers in 19th century Paris. Morning garb, and I don't mean pajamas, is number 7 in our countdown. Known as the monarch of mourning, Queen Victoria influenced how grieving women dressed and behaved in Europe and the United States after the passing of her husband in 1861. She famously mourned him for 40 years until her own demise and started what's now known as the Victorian mourning etiquette. Victorian mourning etiquette came with elaborate rituals to commemorate their dead. It became normal to have incredibly elaborate and lavish funerals, curtail social behavior, and even erect statues and ornate monuments as tombstones. Mourning clothes were part of this and they were introduced for both sexes. Set to show a family's outward display of their inner feelings after the passing of a loved one, the rules for who wore what and for how long were complicated and often outlined in popular journals or household manuals. Call that a mourner's magazine. Jokes aside, men definitely had it a lot easier. They simply wore their usual dark suits along with black gloves, hat bands, cravats, or ties. For women, especially should she be a widow, there were different levels of mourning and garb to wear as you progressed out of deep mourning and into lighter mourning and so forth. Deep mourning uh, was of course black, but also made specifically was a crepe styling, a scratchy silk with a puffed crimped appearance associated with mourning as it doesn't pair with any other clothing. Right. The mourner would eventually stop donning the crepe and then stop donning black. This was called slightening the mourning before cloth colors eventually moved on to gray, mauve, then white until the mourning period was considered complete. Number six in our countdown is the human hair wearers. Fun because it rhymes but creepy for a whole slew of reasons. So what do I mean by human hair wearers? Well, it was a tradition in Victorian era to don jewelry that had segments of human hair embossed, woven, or sealed into it. But for many Victorian people, the amount of hair involved in remembering loved ones went far beyond a little lock in a necklace. In stores and women's magazines, you could find patterns for wreaths made of hair and wire, often floral designs. Bracelets, brooches, earrings, and necklaces were also all very common. In its prime, human hair, jewelry, and decor was considered incredibly fashionable. It's even said that swapping locks of hair was a love token between women-loving women or friends the way that girls today might wear friendship bracelets with each other. I guess if you need a trim and you were already late on a birthday gift, you could really just kill two birds with one stone. Number five in the countdown is all about buggy dresses. The wealthy Victorians were very into the grandeur, looking to feed a fascination with culture especially. Beetle wing embroidery was at a peak of fame in the 18th century India and was quickly appropriated by English visitors while military occupied the country from 1858 to 1946. Elytra, which is the hard casing over a beetle's wing, first appeared on dresses and experienced their first.
first burst of popularity in England by the 1820s, though English women in India had likely been donning it since at least the 1780s. Material used was often white or other pale colors to help augment the reflective green tones of the beetle wing. This visual was made possible when Elytra was paired with Zardozzi, a gold embroidery style often done on colored cottons or silks. Victorians at least didn't appropriate everything about the art form. They made patterns and styles of their own for the dresses. Elytra was sewn onto the gowns in an imitation of live beetle patterns, a reflection of Victorian interest in naturalism and zoology. Not sure why anyone wants to look like they have live bugs crawling on them, but... Okay. Number four is the casual ball gown. One of the most notable shifts in Victorian time was that fashion began to be differentiated by gender rather than class. This reflected the changing roles of women in society. And let me say, every part of Victorian women's fashion seems tortuous. You start your day layering on long, crotchless underwear and tunics before strapping a metal cage to your waist. You then wear an average of six skirts over that, alongside bodices and corsets that would forever change the placement of your organs and potentially even suffocate you to death. The reported average weight of a Victorian dress when fully on could be anywhere between 14 and 22 pounds. But the risk doesn't end there. In fact, it was everywhere. It was estimated that between the 1850s and 1860s, 3,000 women in England died from their crinolines catching fire, as airy fabrics and hoop-supported skirts also allowed for plenty of air to circulate beneath a dress, which could also make a small flame grow out of control in seconds. In 1860s, the New York Times reported that 40,000 women worldwide perished from dress related fires. Another common occurrence was to see them pulled into machinery after walking too close and having some of the skirts catch in exposed parts. Yikes. It's no wonder that the large ball gown crinolines phased out in the late 1800s, but then bustles came in and they were worse in different ways. While more practical as it was slim on the sides and the front, it required women to sacrifice movement and comfort in order to achieve a fashionable shape like the course it did. They began to alter women's spines, ribs, and organs over time as they required women to twist their bodies completely in order to be able to sit down. Overall, while movies and TV may make these beautiful gowns seem whimsical and ethereal, they truly were just death traps. Number three in the countdown is bird brained. I enjoy my puns, but there's a reason for that one. This trend was started by the notorious Marie Antoinette, a rebel in the French courts for her outlandish fashion and accessories. Amongst her pile of powdered curls, Marie was often seen with feathered caps and bonnets. While this look became an envy for women across America and Europe, the trend did struggle to take off initially as much of the aristocracy was perturbed by it. However, a trend is a trend, and eventually the English society was persuaded. They donned mainly ostrich, pheasant, or peacock feathers at first. Eventually entire songbirds were stuffed after their death and adorned these hats. By the late 1800s, the plume trade had decimated several species of birds, including flamingos, birds Birds of Paradise and rosy spoonbirds. Topping the endangered list were the snowy and great egrets, as at one point their pure white feathers were worth more than gold. Promoters of the feather trade knew what they were doing and also knew that the public didn't understand the carnage that their fashion was sieging on these animals. They held that wearing feathers and whole birds brought city dwellers closer to nature, that it improved people's awareness and knowledge of bird species. Thankfully, it's due to the inevitable public awareness and then disapproval that bird hat sales diminished and went out of trend altogether. Number two slot in the countdown is Paris Green. It seemed Parisian aristocracy had a chokehold on the globe with their trends. It's believed Empress Eugenie was to have worn a dress so stunning at the Paris Opera one evening in 1864 that it was featured in newspapers globally the next day. It was a deep yet vibrant green, one rumored to almost glow in darkness. The green of Paris quickly became the hue of the social elite. So how was Paris is green made and why was it so dangerous? The color was discovered when chemists combined copper and arsenic poison. The result was a dye brighter than all the other greens available on the market. Copper wasn't what gave this color its iconic nickname however. Arsenic is a highly hazardous substance that causes skin sores, vomiting, diarrhea, and in some circumstances cancers or death, as we know now. But they didn't. When factory workers arms and hands began to wilt away from sores and decay that could only be connected to the dye, French and German governments enacted legislation prohibiting the production of arsenic based pigments. It's the right thing to do. Meanwhile, the British government mainly ignored them. Even when Matilda Schreuer famously died of arsenic poisoning with the whites of her eyes stained green from her working in factories. This was deemed 
accidental poisoning by the government at the time. Paris Green remained popular in England until ironically it just went out of trend. It's a little bit of an abrupt ending honestly. No justice for those exposed in workplaces or compensation for suffering. But nothing takes the cake quite like the Victorian trend of looking dead, which is number one in our countdown. You'd figure people look dead enough as is inhaling arsenic and mercury from their clothes and shoes and hats constantly, let alone their home decor. But looking dead was the fashion of the day. This look was specifically modeled after how tuberculosis affected you. Pale skin, watery eyes, red lips. While this disease was decimating the lower status, higher status women recreated it with makeup and arsenic consumption. You heard me right. In order to get pale skin, women consumed arsenic. In order to not die from arsenic, the consumer had to follow a careful process, eating small doses to build up a tolerance. Now, arsenic is addictive, so if they at any point stopped the consumption, they would experience withdrawals such as vomiting, stomach pains, convulsions, hair loss, nervous system failure, kidney failure, delusions, the list goes on. Some women were stuck taking it for the rest of their lives. For the desired watery eye look, women would put citrus or even perfume in their eyes. Some went farther, using belladonna flower, also known as deadly nightshade, for longer lasting tears. However being poisonous, little wonder why blindness was a widely reported as a symptom of belladonna drops. No wonder it did such a good job. Red lip paint included? You guessed it, more poison. In this case, usually lead. All of these poisonous products would contribute to illnesses and facial decay. Death was of course a long term side effect of the usage once poisoning reached its crescendo. Suffice to say, while you may really want to fit in, some trends are not worth getting on board for, especially if they'll slowly melt your face off. Number 10, Queen Victoria. It's all blind herself. Her Royal Majesty and Queen of the British Empire. Queen Victoria. She's responsible for a lot of things, including a nice long holiday in the summer where dads get to be irresponsible with fireworks. Nice. All fun jokes aside, she was the queen of the monarch and she wasn't the worst queen ever, but uh, during her reign, the British Empire had never really been stronger as it took part in absorbing many smaller nations into the empire. And they didn't ask nicely if you catch my drift. India, China, and uh, a lot of parts of Africa. Africa had a rough time back then. It was pretty hard for that continent. They all felt the wrath of the queen's expansionist fist. It's really sad, actually. Goddamn. Number nine, Thebes. Times, specifically in Victorian London, weren't the best. It most certainly wasn't the cleanliest place on earth, and there were orphans asking for more porridge. I don't know. I didn't read the book, guys. Sorry. Lack of rights, social expectations and pressure, and a lot of double standards. Honestly, it just wasn't an easy time for women. Well, it shouldn't really come as a surprise, but thievery and pickpocketing were often done even by women, though. I mean, what choice do you have at that point? The idea of ladies was so ladylike or elegant that it wasn't possible, or at least people thought it wasn't possible, that they could be criminals. What a backhanded compliment. Well, are women a criminal? I certainly don't think so, sir. It's not possible. It's very possible. There are tons of thieves and pickpockets. That's just ridiculous. Number eight, Jane Toppin. Take a trip with me to Boston. We can see Bunker Hill, Old North Church, and Fanu Hall. Ooh, cool. We could also visit a very nice nurse from the 1880s who was taking care of the elderly. Jolly Jane, as she became to be known, was a nurse who took care of the elderly. And by take care, I mean the same way you took care of your first hamster. Mmm, yeah, not so great, was it? Now, how did he know that? I know. She would dose up the old geezers with a healthy Keith Richards sized dose of morphine. Yeah! There's only so much rock stars that can handle that level of rock and roll. And guys, grandma and grandpa, they're not one of them. They can't handle that kind of stuff. After that, she would lay down with them and just like chill with the body, because that's, that's what you do. Ugh. Before she was caught, there was an estimated 31 grandmas and grandpas not at the dinner table after having her as a nurse. I'm just gonna lay down right beside you. It's gonna be great. Just gonna lay down. <laughs> Number seven, Typhoid Mary. My mom wasn't the best cook on planet Earth, but God willing, she tried. You know, she she really put in a lot of work. 
Excuse the meme here, but she makes a mean spaghetti though. God, I love mom's spaghetti. I really, I really do. And her cookies. Oh, she makes the best cookies. Everyone should agree with me in the comment section so I can show my mom and tell her she hasn't made cookies in a while. Tell my mom to mix with cookies. It's time she makes cookies, man. They're so freaking good. They're the best on earth, I swear. Oh, well, my mother is okay. She doesn't make up the Gordon Ramsay standards, but that's okay because no matter how well typhoid Mary made the lamb sauce, it was always gonna make people green as Typhoid Mary was an asymptomatic carrier of typhoid fever. Yes, that's what we're talking about, Typhoid Mary. Crazy enough, after she found out that she was asymptomatic with typhoid, she insisted upon cooking. She kept going, which got more people sick. Surprise. She was forcibly quarantined multiple times in her life. You can't make this stuff up. Please stop cooking, you're sick. I'm gonna do what I want, you can't tell me what to do. Number six, Bell Star. You know, for those who enjoy adult entertainment, her name kind of sounds like it came from there, right? Anyway, she was a cowgirl and outlaw in the 1880s and in the Lone Star State. She was married to an Indian and oftentimes as a couple would offer help to other outlaws needing refuge at their ranch. In 1883, her and her husband were caught trying to steal a horse, very RDR of them, hmm, and spent time in the old slammer. They continued their outlaw ways until it all went Dutch Vanderlyn, meaning it didn't go very well. One day, like any other good western, a stranger had come to the ranch, kind of out of nowhere, and gave Bell Star a taste of the law. Just happened to be with a big iron. To this day, nobody knows what happened, who the stranger was, or why she was bang bang. No one, no one knows. No one, no one. It's crazy. There, was, there should be a movie about that. Big iron on his hip, all fancy anyway. Number five, Mary Surratt. I actually didn't know this one, but perhaps maybe our American audience remembers. Some will recall a time when America was divided in twain. After all, a house divided amongst itself cannot stand. A certain top-hatted bearded president did his best to restore the union. It took a lot of years and lives, but he managed to do it. However, some were still not pleased, a one John Wilkes Booth to be specific had to ask the president a leaded question, if you catch my drift. Well, after assassinating one of the most beloved presidents in American history, he needed to hide. You, you gotta hide after that. And Mary Surratt was the woman who'd let him hide. So I think aiding and abetting, as well as harboring the most wanted man in America at the time, counts as scandalous. She also had some other anti-union behavior as well. Hmm, that's not good. Nazi, Nazi, not very nice. Number four, Lizzie Borden. Lizzie Borden took an axe, gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. Huh, isn't that nice? <laughs> oh boy. Yes, that's right, the late 1800s teenage daughter who maybe perhaps pulled an OJ Simpson. Nah, we're not sure, I don't know. Maybe she did not sort of brutally unalive her families. <laughs> no one else was found at the scene, and then she was acquitted. That sounds just like OJ. Which, given how women were treated back in the day, is kind of strange because I, it just feels like women who are clearly not guilty were punished for stuff they didn't do, and women who are for sure guilty get off free. Her alibi was that she was in the barn when it happened, and then she walked to the house and, Mom and Dad, what's going on here? Let me just wash off my bloody, my bloody shorts here. What? Who what did that? What? That's crazy. Number three, Mary Ann Cotton. Marriage can be tough. Sure, but Marianne Cotton is the reason today you can't collect on life insurance when your spouse mysteriously, get your finger quotes out, mysteriously passes away. It all started when she predicted the passing of her stepson, and then it happened. Well, that's weird. After that, it was her husband here, and then another husband there, and well, it's starting to get a little fishy, don't you think? Well, once these unexpected passings were looked into, they all had something in common, something in their tummies. Arsenic. Yes, she was getting rid of her husbands and then trying to claim the insurance money. Evil, but ahead of her time, like 50 years ahead of her time. That's that's insurance fraud. That's interesting. And well, it's also it's also like cold-blooded, cl calculated, unaliving, you know. But but insurance fraud too. <laughs> Number two, Tilly Kilmick. Okay, how about a literal psychic who knew when all of our late husbands were going to pass? In the late Victorian era, Tilly Kilmick was first found predicting the passing of scruffy wild dogs in the ghettos of Chicago. It's kind of a weird thing to say, like, 
Mm, yeah, see that dog? The dog's not gonna make it. The dog? No, he's not gonna make it. Anyway, <laughs> somehow she always knew when they were going to expire. Then it was her late husband of 29 years. That's kind of strange, 29 years, and he ends up, hmm, that's weird. After cashing the insurance money, which she got immediately, she started dating immediately, where oblivious man after man kept passing, and very shortly after she married more and more. Well, she was a regular Marianne Cotton, to say the least, as she too was using arsenic on her husband to collect insurance money. She eventually was arrested, and her stipulation for being in prison was that she was not allowed to cook for anyone. I think that's fair, that's good. Don't let her cook, Don't, that's a good idea. Number one, ladies of the evening. Love them, hate them, or spend a lot of money on them in Vegas. That's, that's, that's Las Vegas, baby. The era was defined by them, especially in London, whoo, baby. I mean, at night, you really couldn't walk anywhere without a fair lass daintily waving her hand in hopes of luring in a customer which wasn't really an issue given that bedroom related sicknesses were at an all time high. Syphilis specifically had shockingly high percentage of the population and would make you think twice. Well, it would make us think twice, it would make me think twice, but people back then, uh, they kinda just went for it. Right, is something wrong with you, love? I don't care, let's go anyway. Kick it off the list at number 10, Smokey Behind. When somebody tells you that you're just blowing smoke, it means that you're lying, okay? You've now been given exaggerated information of sorts. Well, back in the 18th century, they literally had to blow tobacco smoke at your behind. Yeah, weirdest work break ever, I'd say. So why did we perform magician enemas back in the day? What was the deal here? Well, tobacco smoke enemas were used to treat quite a few symptoms, or they thought so, including a common cold. These enemas came in these fancy kits with a fancy rubber tube. It was all fancy because it was an honest medical practice at the time. It was done by legit medical practitioners. This is the funniest part. The idea was that the tobacco smoke could warm up a soon to be deceased body. The nicotine would stimulate your adrenal glands, jolting you back into good health. The best health, might we say. And the way they would do it in the mid 1800s was by just blowing smoke and just waiting, seeing what happened. We're figuratively and literally blowing smoke. That's the origin of that saying. Fun fact there. Imagine doing that today. Like, hey, I think I dislocated my shoulder. What do I do? He's like, hey, one sec. Number nine, alarm clocks. While the medical world was one threat in Victorian times, apparently so was the technological side. Who knew? We obviously didn't have reliable alarm clocks back in the 1800s, obviously, but we did have jobs. So in order to get up on time, lamp lighters or knockers would come by and tip you off. Yeah, they would just yell in your window and just alarm. That's how you'd wake up. A man would yell into your window and smack you with a stick. Legend has it a young man named Sam Wardell, he got a little creative with his wake up calls. He needed more than a lamp lighter at 5 a.m. So he would Tony Stark this alarm clock gadget. He would use wires, a bunch of stones, all that unsafe stuff. Then at a certain time, stones would fall to the ground, of course, waking him up and presumably everyone else in the building. That would be alarming. Well, Christmas Eve, 1885, tragedy unfolded. A few friends had come over for a holiday visit, so Sam had to move some furniture around, rightfully so, to make room for, you know, windmills and break dancing, whatever they did in Victorian Christmas times. The next morning, he forgot to put things back in the small apartment, and the obvious happened. The rocks then fell on him while he was asleep. Yeah, that probably doesn't feel too good. I thought iPhone alarms were jarring. I take back everything I've ever said. Number eight, relaxative. Okay, so right off the bat, the Victorian era was a little messy. I'm sure you've gathered this by now here on Bumblebee. But these messy new illnesses were putting lots of pressure on medical practitioners, so they were desperate for these new treatments. We laugh at Victorian medical treatments, but they tried, okay? They at least tried. They also achieved many medical breakthroughs as well. But when it comes to handling chicken pox in the Victorian era, well, that wasn't one of them. That was not our finest hour. Chicken pox in the Victorian era was being treated by using laxatives. Yeah, let that sink in for a moment. I have chicken pox, what should I do? Well, try some laxatives. Yeah, folks would slam some castor oil and then, ready for this? They would get even more sick. Who would have thought? You thought you were uncomfortable before, castor oil, yeah, chug that, and then, now you're even weaker, now you're dead. Number seven, backed up. Let's say it's the Victorian era and let's say you're constipated, right? It happens, you know? Well, bad ideas will most likely follow, if you didn't already guess that. According to Merck's 1899 medical manual, small amounts of strychnine were prescribed to those who were constipated. Yeah, the strychnose nux vomica was thought to better the gastric functions. Even a small amount of this stuff would attack your respiratory system. You'd contract, you convulse, it's horrible. It'd be a painful way to go out. It's much, much worse than being constipated. Any day, I would much rather be constipated than any type of strychnine, are you kidding me? Number six, leeches. 
I grew up with hearing problems. I've been around the block with ear aches, ear infections. I had ear tubes numerous times, all that jazz. So I feel really bad for the folks in this next one, okay? I hear you, pun intended. In the Victorian era, medical practitioners would say to use leeches for your ear infections. That's the number one trick, they don't want you to know. There it is. Once they're attached to you, the idea was that they can numb pain while at the same time providing proteins and peptides to its host. So on paper, again, the idea made sense. But the science didn't quite follow, did it? It wasn't entirely hopeless though. Recently in 2004, the FDA reintroduced leeches to the medical world, yeah, because their bite can break up blood clots and induce blood flow. So it's not entirely hopeless. We talked about leech collectors on this channel before, so of course we have to talk about more of the science that they were hoping to achieve with it, right? Also, I worked at a retirement home when I was 16. I thought that job sucked. Imagine being a leech collector? No way. Number five, cat attacks. If I had to pick, I would of course say I'm 100% a dog person. I got, I'm sorry, I grew up with two cats, I'm allergic. I grew up with two dogs, not allergic. Dog guy all the way, sorry. Cats are cool, but this next story just totally freaked me out. Back in 1870, this rich woman had put her time, energy, and resources into cat breeding. How lovely is that? She had tons of cats, she loved all of them, and they loved her. Again, I'm allergic, so this, I'm already sneezing just reading about this story. It was the 1800s, okay? A lot of candles, everything was obviously extremely flammable, and disaster hit often in Victorian times. And in 1870, a fire broke out at this young woman's home. The cats were trapped inside the house. Now, they made it outside, don't freak out or anything, they all made it out. But by the time the two maids had kicked the door open to rescue said cats, they had gone full primal. They were afraid, they were freaking out. They were just scratching their way out through anyone and everything. The fire in the house had obviously scared them, so when the doors were open, these two maids were both sadly attacked by all of these cats. What a horrible thank you for saving all of their lives. I pulled my cat's tail when I was younger. I learned real quick uh, never to do that ever again. Number four, hiccups. Today we have many cures for hiccups, yeah. You gotta get scared or hold your breath or drink water like while you're doing a handstand. I don't know, everyone's got weird ideas, whatever. But nothing was as dangerous as the Victorian era hiccup cure, yeah. Ready for this one, don't try it. This one's scarier than a jump scare, that's for sure. In 1899, again, in the good old Merck Medical Manual, it recommended using chloroform to cure your hiccups. Uh? Yeah, just completely damage your entire nervous system and poison your kidneys, for sure. To get rid of hiccups, that's way better. This 19th century anesthetic was not a solution. Never try this. Continue scaring your family and friends. That's definitely the way we handle hiccups now. Number three, tapeworms. Back in the Victorian times, they really figured out the trick to weight loss. Yeah, was it watching what you eat? Maybe counting your steps? Maybe getting a gym membership? Something like that? Nope, nope, and no way. No, it was way easier than all those things combined. Can you believe that? And you didn't even have to pull back on how much you were consuming. Doesn't this sound fascinating? What is this? Well, all you needed was a handy tapeworm. Yep, I don't have one. I don't know why I pointed. That'd be gross if I had one. Yeah, tapeworm. You know those things that can kill you today if you get one? See, the plan was if you eat a tapeworm egg, okay, it will later hatch in your stomach and at that point you could just eat anything you wanted. Because every time you ate, the tapeworm would also eat. So you could get your snack on while still rocking those Victorian skinny jeans, right? Tapeworm cyst pills or go for a jog. Your call. Number two, Victoria's reign. Queen Victoria's reign started in 1837 and it lasted until the queen's death later on in 1901. At just age 18, Alexandrina Victoria had to rise up to the throne. She was born, of course, on May 24th, 1819. Queen Victoria was fifth in line when she was born, so right off the bat, it was actually highly unlikely that she would ever get the crown. Then one by one, out of nowhere, all of her family members began passing away suddenly. In four years, three of Victoria's cousins passed away, and then her father and grandfather both died a week apart from each other. So by the time 1830 rolled around, Victoria was only 11 years old, and already she was next in line for the throne. That's how fast it happens. So as if that wasn't already stressful enough, Victoria was brought up under the Kensington system, which if you haven't heard of before, it's, it's pretty awful. Victoria's mother, Duchess Victoria of Kent, she created this Kensington system to control her daughter. She literally isolated the child from mates or family members, anything fun or social, you name it. Her mother did this to keep her Pure, of course, to keep her the most pure lady. This system sounds awful. Her mother would monitor her every action, including who she can see or speak to. Victoria only had two playmates growing up. That's it. I'm like, hey, me too. 
She had her half-sister, Princess Fedora of Lennington, and the Duchess attendant, Sir John Conroy, his daughter, Victoire. I mean, only three friends growing up, that's cruel. She shared a room with her mother until she was finally queen. Yeah, she couldn't walk down the hallway alone at any point. She had to always walk with her mother by her side, even to the washroom, that's crazy. Victoria has reflected on her childhood since, and yeah, she hates John Conroy for manipulating her mother, and she actually refers to him as Demon Incarnate, so. That's good, it's a nice nickname. Incarnate, incarnate. He's a demon, he's the worst. Let's just call him that. And finally, number one, royal enemies. Being the queen and all, a security team is of course needed at all times. And during her reign, there were multiple attempts to harm the young Queen Victoria. The first attack was back in 1840. It was a young guy named Edward Oxford and he attacked the queen's carriage. Just ran at it like a crazy guy. Obviously, then thankfully, nothing happened. But when Edward was later accused of high treason, he was actually found not guilty due to insanity. Then a couple years later, in 1842, it happened again, but this time it was two men attacking the carriage. And then in 1849, her carriage was attacked by William Hamilton. In 1850, as the carriage was passing the gates of Buckingham Palace, Robert Pate, a retired soldier, ran up and hit the carriage with his cane. He was going nuts as well. Everyone wants this carriage. This is like the ultimate, no one's getting through this carriage, apparently. Victoria was okay, luckily, but of course she was shook after all these events. Then again in 1842, 1849, 1872, attempt after attempt, it was horrifying. But then things got a little worse with a man named Boy Jones. Yeah, this guy stalked the queen from 1838 until 1841. This guy somehow managed to break into Buckingham Palace more than once. He knew a way in just to Buckingham Palace, which should never be a thing in the first place. And the weird part is here, Boy Jones, once he was inside the palace, he would hide under the queen's sofa. And he would also just sit on her throne for hours, just hanging out. Yeah, he would pretend he's Cersei Lannister and just sit on the throne for a minute or two. Think about life. Eventually, thankfully, he got caught, but Imagine coming home and Boyd Jones is sitting on your couch. You're like, what are you doing? Take that shirt off. Get out of here. 